It was once easy for people to live within their means. Our parents and grandparents may have earned a low income by today's standards, but they were able to buy a lot more with it than many people can buy with their income today. In a 2016 article, Guardian Finance editor Patrick Collinson shared some family experiences to demonstrate this point. Back in the 1960s, his father was able to raise five children on a salary that's the equivalent to £25,000 or $32,807.50 a year. His mother was able to stay at home to take care of him and his siblings. Furthermore, his father was able to buy a house, a television, and a car entirely from his earned income. In 2016, Collinson's daughter also made £25,000 or $32,807.50 a year, but she did not live as well as her grandfather did. For housing, she lived in a room in an ex-council flat share instead of owning her own home. She could not afford to keep her car and could barely keep ahead of the bills every month. And she is not alone. According to a World Bank press release, almost half of the world's population, 3.4 billion people, still struggle to meet basic needs. What happened? Why does it seem like so many people will be poorer than past generations? Like Collinson's daughter, many people around the world are paying higher cost of living expenses than past generations. Take housing as an example. Collinson notes that the cost of homes in the area of London where his father bought his house has gone through the roof. He observes that houses in Rise Park Romford now sell for £400,000 to £450,000, or nearly 200 times the £2,400 my father paid for when his home was built in 1956. Collinson's daughter would not be able to afford to buy a home that expensive on her meager salary. In Collinson's words, it would be an unimaginable prospect for her to make a down payment on a house because it would require her to find £40,000 to £50,000 or twice her gross annual pay. In contrast, her grandfather had to pay a 10% deposit or £240 equal to a fifth of his annual wage when he purchased his home in the 1960s. Another country where housing prices have sharply increased over the years is Australia. Macquarie University researchers Peter Abelson and Demi Chung conducted a study of housing prices in Australia from 1970 to 2003. In 1970, the annual median house price in Perth was $17,500, while it was $12,800 in Melbourne. By 1990, the annual median house prices in Perth and Melbourne increased to $101,125 and $131,000 respectively. And by 2003, the annual median house prices had doubled in those areas. In Perth, the annual median house price was $205,000, while it was $276,000 in Melbourne. One Australian insurance company points out how housing prices over the past 30 years have increased to the point that they have outstripped average income in Sydney, Australia. In 1985, the median price for a detached house in Sydney was about 73,000 Australian dollars, or roughly three and a half times the average yearly earnings at the time. In 2015, the median house price in Sydney is over $900,000, around 11 times the average annual earnings. With the rise in the number of two-income households, raising a child is another cost of living expense that has become more costly than before. In New Zealand, for example, the costs of care and clothing for children have significantly increased in a relatively short period of time. According According to a 2019 New Zealand Herald article, cash-strapped Kiwi parents are spending almost twice as much raising kids as they were five years ago. New research finds that the average spend on the three biggest rising costs, childcare, footwear, and clothing, is estimated to be 5,028 New Zealand dollars per baby this year, compared to $3,034 in 2013 or 14. Other data from the Bank of New Zealand indicates that the cost of raising a child in New Zealand could be even higher. Last year, BNZ estimated that the cost of preschool care per child was $8,750 a year for one child. The World Economic Forum recently named New Zealand as the country with the most expensive childcare. World Economic Forum senior writer Sean Fleming states that based on 2017-2018 data, a couple with two young children earning the average wage have to devote 37.3% of their pay to childcare in New Zealand. Another country that made the list of the World Economic Forum's list of countries with the most expensive childcare is the US, which has childcare expenses accounting for 33.2% of a couple's average salary. Parenting website Fatherly provides a detailed breakdown of these expenses. According to Fatherly, it's not food, housing, or transportation, but childcare costs that are busting family budgets the most in the US. Statistics provided by Fatherly show how these costs have more than quadrupled between 1960 and 1995. In 1960, when most mothers stayed home to watch their kids, childcare accounted for only 2% of a household's income. 
by 1995 that number had grown to 9% or almost $9,870 per year. There are other costs of raising a child that have skyrocketed since the 60s. The cost of childhood education, such as elementary school tuition and fees, has gone up considerably. A CBS News article states that education costs have sharply risen since 1960, when USDA estimated that these expenses were around 2% of child-rearing expenses. Fatherly estimates that childcare and education costs now account for 16% of the budget, or around $38,040 over the course of a child's life. In addition, American parents today are spending more on healthcare for their children than their grandparents did. Fatherly notes that according to the USDA data, the price of out-of-pocket medical and dental services not covered by insurance and prescription drugs has more than doubled to around 9% of a family's budget, up from 4% in 1960, and accounts for between $1,180 and $1,300 a year per kid. Going into debt has become a popular way to deal with these and other expenses. News website NewsTrail recently reported that many families in the developed world are scrambling with personal debt. This was not the case for past generations. While people in the past borrowed money too, they had less credit options and less difficulty paying back what they owed. In a KERA radio interview, Lewis Hyman, a business history professor at Cornell University, discussed the history of credit in America, which is where the concept of the credit card originated. His discussion gives us an idea about the borrowing habits of previous generations. We all hear how our parents and grandparents never borrowed any money. But they borrowed all the time, Hyman says. They just borrowed in different ways. Hyman observes people mainly had store credit cards through the 1950s and 1980s, and they generally had the money to pay their credit card bills monthly. Wages just kept going up and up and up, he said, so that if you borrow today, you could expect to make more in the future. As most of you have probably noticed, the rosy economic conditions experienced by previous generations did not last. The combination of easy credit for high-risk customers and hard economic times that resulted in what Fortune magazine refers to as a precarious employment have turned many people into debt slaves. And experts predict the number of debt slaves will increase in the future. According to NewsTrail, economists are starting to use the term debt slaves as they see another cycle of increased borrowing and a decrease in savings, all within a system that encourages people to continue borrowing in order to spend on consumer goods. The debt that's currently enslaving people comes from various sources. Credit card purchases, mortgage loans, unpaid medical bills, and other borrowed money for all people living in a household are lumped together in what's commonly known as household debt. A 2018 study by credit data management company Bloom found that household debt around the world has been growing since the early 2000s. One interesting finding of the study is that Chinese households have more debt than American households. Household debt, when measured relative to disposable income as opposed to GDP, has skyrocketed from 40% in 2007 to over 106% in 2017, according to the Bank for International Settlements. Compared to the US, which has a debt to disposable income ratio of 105%, Chinese households are suffering from a higher level of indebtedness than American households on average. Unfortunately, household incomes in China have not increased enough to cover the higher household debt. While Chinese households have been on the receiving end of rapid income growth for the past decades, income still haven't kept pace with the debts, as household income has grown on average 12% a year, while household debt has grown on average 23% a year. As such, household debt growth has far outpaced household income growth. Another country that has more household debt than the US is Canada. The study describes Canada's debt to disposable personal income ratio of 170% as the highest in the global north. While US households are struggling with a combination of auto loans, student loans, and revolving credit as well as mortgage debt, the study found that household debt in Canada has been mostly driven by home ownership growth and a mortgage boom. The Bank of Canada has been somewhat successful in slowing down the increase of this type of household debt through interest rate hikes designed to dampen demand and overconfidence in the housing market. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, is another source of data for household debt as a percentage of net household disposable income. All of the top five countries with the highest household debt have debt that's over 200% of net household disposable income. The country with the fifth highest household debt is Switzerland, with household debt that's 212% of net household disposable income. In fourth place is Australia, with household debt that's 216% of net household disposable income. Both Norway and the Netherlands are tied for second place with household debt that's 239% of net household disposable income. Finally, the country with the highest household debt is Denmark, which has a household debt that is 281% of net household disposable income.
While this amount of household debt may alarm some, Denmark's National Bank is not concerned about it. On its website, it explains that the main reason household debt is higher in Denmark than it is in other countries is that Danish households buy homes or consumer durables, such as cars. These debts are a reflection that, compared with other countries, it's relatively easy and inexpensive to borrow against wealth in Denmark. And most of the people who are borrowing money are wealthy. Denmark's National Bank is also confident that Denmark's large household debts will be repaid because of the country's well-developed financial system and the large personal wealth available to Danes after they retire. In addition, Denmark has a combination of an extensive social safety net and a high level of public service that reduce the risk that households are unable to service their loans. While some of the debt we are burdened with today are for cost of living expenses that are beyond our control, other debt reflects that many of us are contributing to our own poverty through questionable consumer behavior. We have a different attitude about shopping than earlier generations did, and it's caused us to develop more wasteful spending habits than those of consumers of the past. Through advertisements of the late 19th and early 20th century, we see consumers of this time were more pragmatic. Richard W. Pauley, a marketing professor at the University of British Columbia, describes the main approach used in ads created between 1890 and 1925 as veneration of products. In these ads, Pauley notes that the sales strategy was direct and rational, describing the products and their qualities, linking these to common sense advantages such as saving time, money, or energy. In contrast, today's consumers often shop for emotional reasons. Many people buy things to make themselves feel better, a coping mechanism known as retail therapy. Business Wire recently reported the results of a 2016 U.S. shopping survey. It found retail therapy is still a good pick-me-up, with 96% of adults and 95% of teens admitting that they participate in retail therapy. In 2015, 15,000 people across 17 countries participated in a poll measuring pick-me-up purchases called the MasterCard Treat Index. According to one source, the poll found that people in Turkey frequently engaged in retail therapy, with two-thirds of consumers claiming to make regular cheer-up transactions. Young people made more pick-me-up purchases than older people. The poll found that millennials are nearly twice as likely, 60% as boomers, 34%, to treat themselves once a month or more frequently. And there are a large number of people who shop as a hobby. The Drum, which is Europe's largest marketing website, describes shopping as the third favorite pastime in Singapore. It cites the results of a study that found 84% of Singaporeans love to shop online, with 1.7 million of them making one purchase a week. Online shopping as a hobby is also popular in China. A 2017 survey conducted by financial services firm KPMG and My.com revealed that online shopping has effectively become a national pastime in China, with 77% of respondents identifying it as their favorite leisure activity. In addition, the news website Daily Beast notes that the world's most avid clothes shoppers are Chinese, with 31% saying that their clothes shopping is their favorite thing to do. These motives for shopping often result in buying more than we need, which leaves us with a full house and an empty wallet. Excessive spending on clothes is a good example. In 1930, the average American woman owned an average of nine outfits, according to fast fashion and sustainability expert Elizabeth Klein. In the 21st century, that amount has increased dramatically. A 2016 Daily Mail article reports that the average American woman has 103 items of clothing in her closet. The modern-day American woman may have more clothes than her 1930s counterpart, but surprisingly she does not wear most of them. A survey of 1,000 U.S. women conducted by organizer company ClosetMaid found that these women only wear about 10% of the items in their closet. What happened to the other 90%? The women considered 21% to be unwearable, 33% to be too tight, and 24% to be too loose. In addition, another 12% of their wardrobe consisted of new unworn clothing. How much are these wasteful wardrobes costing the average American woman? A 2017 article by retail franchise company Winmark states that women spend an average of $3,400 a year on clothing and accessories. For some American women, this is nearly two months' salary. American women are not the only ones who overspend on clothes that often end up hanging uselessly in their closets. A 2017 Telegraph article reports that the average British woman owns 95 items of clothing and only wears 59% of them regularly. Like American women, British women spend a lot of money on unwearable clothes. According to an article in the UK version of Marie Claire, new research finds that the average woman owns 2,400 pounds worth of clothes that she doesn't wear. Another big spender on clothing that is largely unworn is the average Australian woman. According to the Daily Mail, the average Australian woman buys 27 kilograms of new clothes each year, throws away 23 kilos every 12 months, and only wears 33% of her wardrobe. We cannot find exactly how much the average Australian woman spends on clothes, but in 2015, Australia topped fashion website WWD's list of countries with the highest per capita expenditures on apparel. 
WWD states that Australians spend on average $1,050 annually. Some of the excess shopping that we previously discussed is the result of another bad spending habit that will leave us poorer than past generations – impulse buying. According to a 2018 CNBC article, a survey by SlickDeals.net found that the average US consumer makes three unplanned purchases a week, which adds up to about $5,400 per year on impulse buys. British people are almost as impulsive as Americans when it comes to shopping. A 2018 independent article reported the findings of a study commissioned by online lender MyJar.com. The study revealed that British people make an average of nine impulse buys per month. It also found that the typical adult blows almost 200 pounds a month on everything from chocolate and sweets to new sofas, clothes, and takeaways. These impulse buys add up to about $3,105 per year and close to 144,000 pounds, or about $186,287 over the lifetime of British consumers. Impulse spending is a problem in other parts of the world too. Nielsen's 2013 global survey of consumer shopping behavior revealed that many online respondents in the Asia-Pacific and Middle East or Africa areas are impulse buyers and adopters of new products. When presented with the statement, I often buy things I do not need impulsively, 52% of respondents in Thailand somewhat or strongly agreed with the statement. While the percentage of those somewhat or strongly agreeing with the statement in India and China were 48 and 44% respectively, Egypt and Saudi Arabia had the same percentage of respondents, 42. Now, there's a new social trend that's causing young people to go deeper into debt – social media consumerism. Financial website The Ascent explains how social media increases spending. The biggest reason social media encourages you to spend money is an age-old concept taken to the 21st century extreme. Peer pressure, previously known as keeping up with the Joneses, and now referred to as FOMO – fear of missing out. With social media, you get a constant view of the best parts of other people's lives. You see the meals at fancy restaurants, the designer clothes, and the luxurious vacations. And if you follow any celebrities or influencers, you'll see those types of posts all the time. It's natural to feel a bit jealous and to want the same for yourself. You may laugh at the reasoning behind social media consumerism, but the overspending that results from it is becoming a serious problem. The Ascent cites a study by Alliance Life that found 61% of millennials say they've had feelings of inadequacy about their lives because of what they saw on social media, and 57% said that social media caused them to spend money due to a fear of missing out. It also adds that Credit Karma found that 39% of millennials had even gone into debt just to keep up with their friends. In a recent article, CNBC also explores the financial toll social media is having on millennials. It discusses the finding of Schwab's 2019 Modern Wealth Survey. According to this survey, just under half or 49% of millennials aged 23 to 38 say social media influenced them to spend money on experiences. The survey also found that 48% say they've overspent when sharing experiences with friends, whether it's dining out or going on a group vacation. However, while millennials may be eager to share their experiences of the good life on social media, they tend to hide the financial problems caused by them. According to a Forbes article, out of the 40% of people who went into debt for their social lives, 73% kept it a secret from their friends. Is there any glimmer of hope that millennials can improve their financial circumstances? A Business Insider article tries to see the bright side of the millennial situation, noting experts call them both the brokest and the richest generation. Data from the Fed indicates that individual incomes were falling for millennials, but at the same time family incomes for married couples grew. A study by the Pew Research Center also found that millennial households are earning more than previous generations did at their age nearly any time in the past 50 years. In addition, millennial researcher Jason Dorsey points out that in time inheritances might also add to their wealth. From a big picture viewpoint, millennials will likely receive the greatest wealth transfer in modern history from the baby boomers, Dorsey said. However, the reality is that baby boomers are healthier and living longer than even they planned, so that wealth transfer might not happen for 20 plus years. Did you learn anything new from this video? We bet you did! And if you want to learn even more, then check out this other great infographic show video, or this other great video by us. You might not have a choice about your financial future, but you can pick which of these great videos to watch next. So do it right now!